My mom died when I was eight. And as a result of that, there's just a lot I don't know. I don't know who her first love was. I don't know how she felt about our involvement in Vietnam. I don't know if she was enraged about Watergate. But I do know that she was Jewish. And at least while she was alive, so was I. My brother and I spoke Hebrew. We went to temple on Friday nights. We hid the matzah. We lit candles in the menorah. But we also went to church on Sundays because my father was Christian. And so we did Christmas and Easter. We were sort of a, a full opportunity holiday family. If it involved food or gifts, we were in it. <laughs> but my dad's response to my mother's death was in part to really ramp up the Christianity. So suddenly we were attending revivals and speaking in tongues and people were like fainting around us. We learned that unfortunately all of our neighbors were going to hell. <laughs> My mother's mother, still Jewish of course, was distraught, distraught the day I sat on her lap in her dining room and told her how sorry I was about her eternity in the lake of fire. <laughs> she pushed me off her lap and stormed into the kitchen and all I heard was, Richard Snyder, what are you brainwashing my granddaughter with? She was from Boston. It's the best I could do. My dad apologized, but still, she was going to hell. I didn't really think too much about the loss of Judaism in my life. Every once in a while around Christmas, I'd be like, wasn't there supposed to be kind of a lead up, like eight nights? <laughs> I found an errant dreidel in a dusty corner of the house once. I was like, dreidel, dreidel, dreidel. <laughs> so I didn't really think too much about it until 30 years later when I gave birth to my own daughter in Bangkok as it turned out. By then I was living in Cambodia as a foreign correspondent. And I remember when they brought her into me and I was looking at her little punk rock hair and her blue eyes, and I thought about what it must have been like for my mother, knowing not just that she was gonna miss the rest of her life, but that she'd miss all of mine too. I really had never thought about it like that before. And I felt this profound responsibility to connect my daughter to the grandmother she'd never know. And the only thing I could identify about that grandmother was Judaism. So a few months later, I managed to find a Jewish expat group in Phnom Penh. And they were about to celebrate Hanukkah and they said, oh, meet us on the docks. And I was like, okay. So I went with my daughter, whose name is Jazz, so Jewish, and um, we boarded a thatched roof boat and we sailed up the Mekong. And we sailed past water buffalo in a village on stilts and we ate coconut fish wrapped in banana leaves. I remembered at temple how my brother and I would run around like lunatics in the basement of the synagogue and we would drink milky tea with like 10 sugar cubes in it. <laughs> but out there on the Mekong we were drinking lemongrass and ginger juice I guess what I'm saying is this was not the Judaism of my youth. This was not the Judaism of anyone's youth. <laughs> so a couple years later, I moved to Washington, D.C. My daughter was preschool age now, and I thought, okay, here's where I'm gonna find like something, anything familiar. And in the middle of the year, in what seemed like a divine miracle to me, I landed her a spot at the Gan School at Addis Israel, which if you don't know, is like the Yale of Jewish preschools in Washington, D.C. <laughs> and the first day I walk in there, I have like a complete out-of-body olfactory experience because I smell something that I don't even remember that I'd forgotten until the moment I smelled it again. It was that noodle cinnamon dish that all Jewish women seem to cook. And my mother used to cook it. I couldn't remember what it was called. I still don't actually remember what it's called. But she made it, and I remembered liking it. I saw tapestries on the wall of men in robes and like stuff written in Hebrew. I was like, oh, maybe I'll learn that again. Everyone I meet is like super welcoming to me. Like everyone 
I have the same story. I used to be Jewish, and then I wasn't Jewish, and now I'm going to be Jewish again. And my little blonde-haired, blue-eyed daughter, she's Jewish, even though she doesn't look Jewish, and everyone's, like, super welcoming. I say this to, like, the woman in the guest, the gift shop, and I say this to, like, the retirees who man the information booth, like, everyone. But almost immediately, my lack of knowledge begins to make me feel just slightly uncomfortable. One woman came up to me, another mother, at one point and said, oh, are you planning your sukkah? And I, it took me like a full minute to understand that she wasn't calling me a sucker. I'd never heard that word. <laughs> I tell the director of the school about how I um, was at the Russian market in Phnom Penh one day and I found what I thought was a menorah and it turned out to be a Buddhist thing that they use in ceremonies, but it still has the requisite number of candle holders, so I'm using it anyway. And she says, we call it a Hanukia, or Hanukia, or Hanukia. I still can't pronounce it. Those were small things, though. The bigger thing was one Friday when it was my daughter's turn to bring grapes and holla for her little pre-K class. And I went with her, and I sat in one of those little teeny tiny chairs that you sit in where your knees are like just under your chin. <laughs> and I watch as she passes out the snacks and then leads her classmates in a prayer in Hebrew and I mean I think it's Hebrew could have been Yiddish I don't know because I don't speak it and a song that I didn't recognize and I just remember feeling like this is what refugees must feel like when they're like happy to have arrived somewhere but also trying to forget all the shit that got them there in the first place right like in trying to find my mother, was I disconnecting with my daughter? We went to the synagogue after her class, and I remembered one day, one night, and one Friday night, as I watched the rabbi take the Torah. And at the, the service on that Friday afternoon, he did the same thing, took the Torah and began to walk it up the aisle. It was a memory that I had forgotten about, but I thought of it because my mother used to wake me up on those Fridays when the Torah would come out because I would sleep through the whole service on her lap. Like, when I really thought about it, the penultimate moment of those Friday night services was a guy pulling something out of a closet. <laughs> Super boring. And now that I was thinking about it, actually hiding the matzah for Elijah the ghost scared the shit out of me. <laughs> I didn't want to go into like a dark bedroom of my house and come upon a ghost. Are you kidding me? By the way, my first date with Ira Glass, I told him this story and he said to me, hmm, it sounds like you didn't have particularly apt parenting. <laughs> I thought we would connect over a shared terror of Elijah, but that didn't, didn't turn out. When the Torah came to our side of the aisle, my daughter kissed it and I kissed it, but I felt like a fraud. Did I even believe what it said? One of the strongest memories I have of my mother is sitting on our black leather couch in our den, stringing popcorn and cranberries for our Christmas tree while my mother and I sneak uh, popcorn kernels to our cat, ABC. Not a Jewish memory at all. When I think about what I've lost with my mother, the superficial stuff doesn't really matter. The noodle cinnamon dish, the tapestries, even the language. What matters is the stuff you'll never get, which is the stuff you can never know. Still, that year at the Gone sort of implanted itself in my daughter and I somehow. I came to understand that what's in our lives is a choice. My mother chose Judaism, but that didn't mean I had to. It was maybe the greatest gift she ever gave me, that freedom of choice. My daughter's nearly nine years old now, and we do every year light the candles on our crazy Buddhist, Jewish, Russian market purchased Cambodian menorah Hanukkah. <laughs> sometimes we get the date right, sometimes we don't. We light the candles, we stand there for a minute, look at them, and then we blow them out, we go have dinner. We know we don't know what we're doing. 
But for us, it's not about finding something we've lost, but more about creating something new altogether. Thank you.